Coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. IP is a unifier of cheap, easy, integratable technology. So instead of having sensors in the paper mill through a gateway and a PLC and you have oceans of hours in, for an engineer to get those values out, if you connect an IP device, it's connected instantly. IP rules the internet. Well, at least the internet that connects people. Will it dominate the internet of things too? There are two endings to this story. In this episode of the IoT Business Show, we discuss one such ending with the Internet of Things expert Joachim Lindberg and how his Swedish rationality takes him there. This is Encore Episode 1 of 4, which originally played in the IPv6 Show podcast. Keep listening if you're interested in the economics of standardization. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business, and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is made possible by sales of my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, and the IoT Inc. Certified IoT Professional, or ICIP, online training and certification program. Become a certified IoT professional by completing the program's three courses, ICIP Technology, ICIP Business, and ICIP Strategy and Digital Transformation. Details of which can be found at www.iot-inc.com. That's www.iot-inc.com. With me today on episode five is Joachim Lindbergh. Joachim is a specialist in the Internet of Things focused on energy efficiency and visualizations. He's worked in both utility companies and startups and is currently CTO of Sustainable Innovation. Joachim, welcome. Thanks for uh, joining me. Thank you very much. Pleased to be uh, talk to you. Yeah, well, I'm just thinking back. The last time we saw each other was at a meetup in San Francisco. I don't know. That must have been like three, four months ago. What have you been doing uh, since then? Well, I've been continuing the work that I was uh, talking about there. Uh, I, the, the reason to go to that meetup was that working with Internet of Things in the energy sector is uh, a very big thing to get actual behavior change since you know you can control you know that you see it and you feel the difference in uh, and that was a discussion of how to uh, get the uh, (laughs) sorry uh, i got a phone call on another line (laughs) Uh, to get uh, people active uh, and and there was an interaction design discussion on that meetup so i was it was a very good meetup no, yeah, it was, and, and actually that was a long way for you to travel to uh, to attend. I guess you were there for other reasons as well. Yeah. Well, why don't we start by uh, you telling me a little bit about yourself uh, and your background in the Internet of Things and, and how you ended up kind of where you are now. Well, I've been working with uh, things or measurements for a long, <laughs> long time. Uh, I started with the uh, at Vattenfall, where we sort of the big utility in Sweden, where we realized, well, mm. we cannot cannot uh, live on just uh, selling electricity. We need to have services. So we built up a whole uh, project, very big project there, to get services into the energy sector. Right, That's and. Smart. With smart things, uh, refrigerators and so on, even refrigerators with screens on, uh, which was uh, very expensive at that time. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so connecting things and getting them to be easy, controllable, and or, also having uh, some uh, level of uh, automatic functions uh, is crucial. And that's led me up to today where, where we really are getting everything connected more or less. So working with utilities um, is a big part of your background, and 
that being extending their services beyond just providing electricity, and that's where you got into the Internet of Things. Uh, does that sound like a good summary? Yeah. Now, to start. let's start things off. What would be your definition of the Internet of Things? Well, <clears throat> a connected device that does something. Mm-hmm. So uh, it it will be connected to a service or some kind of added value that you would uh, then need as a person. Uh, of course, there's also ma- machine-to-machine communications, right. but right. more or less what we feel of, of, of the Internet of Things is when it comes up to you. So that could be a collection of things doing a service for you uh, that you uh, interact with. Oh, okay. uh, and, and especially we see it in, in sports. Uh, it's exploding in sports. You get these Fitbits, you get the measurements right. of your, how, your, uh, how, your, <laughs> how your workout is doing, and you compare that with others. Now, that's true, because I've always been focused on the things part, but you're right. A big, a big part of the Internet of Things is actually self-measurement and measurement of people as well, you know, as well as kind of what they say, but how they operate, I guess. Yeah, and, and interact with you as a human uh, because there's been connected things all the time. We have controlled process industry, we have done paper mills, we've done anything, everything, and those mm-hmm. are things connected, controlling a uh, process, but that's not very much interacting with humans. And the Internet of Things came up when those things were pl- suddenly available on the Internet and you were interacting with them. Mm-hmm. Okay. As, well, now, um, let's let's talk a little bit more on the networking side since this is a networking show let's let's talk a little bit more about networking and how are the internet of things connected to the internet today today yeah and <clears throat> i see uh, uh, the ip part is exploding quite quickly now and and when i was talking of internet of things before or or connected things we were having proprietary protocols to a very big extent Uh, getting proprietary sensors and uh, being on wires or on, on even wireless things but in the end every thing would have a gateway to internet Right. But now we see that, that that gateway is going more or less away and you directly connect your thing. And if, when talking to all of those Internet of Sport things, it's mm-hmm. usually a Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth phone-connected device. Right, right. So you would sy- sync it towards your uh, phone or uh, have it on your Wi-Fi at home. So that's but more... Sorry, but it seems like um, it seems like there's a bit of a resistance to providing that direct connectivity um, to objects. You know, for example, I was at a different meetup in, in San Jose and they were talking about like meters, smart meters, and they're saying, well, why on earth would we want to have all these individual meters on the internet? We have a private network and then perhaps we'll have some sort of gateway, like you were saying, where we could connect to and then gather the information. But they seem to be very resistant to the idea of attaching you know, individual addresses um, to each of the smart meters, for example. Yeah, and I think that's a, a no, uh, industry historical view. I mean, looking at a power plant uh, or, or a paper mill, mm-hmm. would you like to have IP addresses on all the sensors? Well, no. You can have no. any old bus and connect them. But what we see is that IP is a unifier of cheap, uh, easy, usable, easy, integratable technology. Mm. So instead of having sensors in the paper mill through a gateway and a PLC and you have oceans of hours in, for an engineer to get those values out, mm-hmm. if you connect an IP device, it's connected. Instantly. Right. And, right. and the integration work is just like doing anything on the internet. So mm-hmm. I think that IP will drive both directions. Uh, IP will make it easier to connect a paper mill. Mm-hmm. But then mm-hmm. it will also be easier to connect all the power meters. Of course, they will be controlled and secured. Uh, and from the beginning, perhaps even uh, behind a very big firewall and never connected to internet. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. they will be start using IP instead of using proprietary technologies. 
Oh, so that's because it will be more cost effective. So you're saying not only you're saying it's not so much necessarily the addressability, although that could happen in the future. But what you're saying is that by using a standard protocol like IP, that is probably well, obviously for the internet, the most widely used protocol, you get the cost efficiencies, you get the simplicity of you know the network, and you get to use you know existing products. Let's say uh, for maybe interpreting the big data that's coming from it or or whatever the case am i am i correctly kind of uh, summarizing yeah uh, on my presentation on on the show i will show you the the fact today that there are gateways everywhere and mm. those gateways are dedicated expensive yeah and need to be engineered uh, correctly yeah so there's yeah. a lot of engineering hours in getting those gateways working Interesting. So why isn't everyone using IP networks then for the Internet of Things today? Well, I think there's a, a company-driven technology. Uh, for example, we had before uh, the millennium shift uh, a, a company called Echelon, mm -hmm. and they're still alive. And, and they did a technology called Loneworks, which was the u unifying communication protocol for things. Okay. It was available on power line, on radio, on wires, all the physical layers, and they had a 48-bit address of all nodes, a sort of MAC address. Mm -hmm. But nobody's hearing about them now. No. <laughs> they, were, though they, they were the unifying technology. So why didn't everybody use it? Because it, it was a proprietary solution. Right. So all these proprietary solutions will finally go away in the way of doing open technology on IP, internet will crawl slowly, slowly, all the way to down to your wall socket. But it will <laughs> take time. Right, right. So I mean, it's it's already out in the skies, and uh, NASA is using it to connect to stars. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, no, it's true. But then, then why again? You know, I ask again. Why isn't everybody using IP networks? You know, today then for the Internet of Things. I think the main issue is uh, how the MAC protocols and how the, the lower levels of IP uh, take care of battery problems for, for right. uh, wireless things. Right. Uh, it's, it's still an internet protocol. It hasn't been developed enough to get down to the small battery power devices. And, but that's coming now with, with mm -hmm. the six low pan and IPSO alliance technologies. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and now you can run, I mean, you have ADSL, which more or less is IP over uh, a telephone line. So, so IP will further and further uh, extend into technologies that we haven't been using before at the mm -hmm. lower levels. Okay, so what you're saying is, if I understand correctly, that one... You know, everybody has their own reasons to use their own proprietary solutions or maybe use a proprietary solution. But beyond that, there are technical reasons, too. You know, specifically when you're working with these wireless sensor networks that may be a little bit lossy and that the sensors themselves don't have that much power, then perhaps the IPv4 and IPv6 are a little too heavy um, to, to use in those environments. Yeah, at least when you look at the, the um, lower communication protocols uh, mm. below. So when you have connection, interconnection between two radios, uh, the routing protocols and so on, they could be a bit too talky. Uh, right. So therefore you have creations like SIG, B, C, Wave, where they sort of start with the radio connection and then they add up to layers that they shouldn't have been doing. <laughs> okay, so okay. That, I mean... Zigbee, Z-Wave, and so on, they are doing the whole layers construction from, from ISO, both uh, the lower level MAC layers, and all the way up to application level on layer number seven. Ah. And therefore, they are very proprietary or, or enclosed in their view of the world. Well, okay. But Zigbee is now going. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I, I mean, I just want, I want to get back to Zigbee and Z-Wave in a minute, but I just want to just you know, finish off on the IP side of things. Um, the work being done in six low pan and RPL routing, for example, those are, those are trying to, to, uh, um, I guess, 
overcome those those barriers that you talked about earlier, are they not? Yes, exactly. They are doing head compressions to get the IPv6 addresses very short, so you don't need so much air time. Mm -hmm. uh, they are defining how you should sleep and how you should wake up and look mm -hmm. at your routing tables uh, to get a quick know of who to talk to. Mm -hmm. And if you are a repeater or a routing, uh, you need to be perhaps more awake. Uh, but if you are a plane sensor, you could perhaps be sleeping for a very long time, but mm. in a synchronized time, you could wake up and talk to the one you need to in a very short time frame. And using little energy. Very little energy then. Oh, okay. No, that makes sense then. Okay, I did want to talk about Zigbee and Z-Wave. So, so tell me, how are these different from, from regular IP, IPv4, IPv6? How, Zigbee has been around for a while, so Z-Wave. And I'm still hearing about them, but how are they different? Well, Z-Wave started as a uh, technology from Denmark, I think. Uh, and they were looking at the radio networks in homes uh, mm -hmm. or in small, uh, well, I think they started with smart home. I think both of them did, right? Both of yeah. them were more home automation. So they were uh, starting with a radio technology in a frequency band that was interesting for home automation. Mm. And they saw that, well, it's impossible to get p things talking to each other. We need to have a definition of how to first start to get an address, uh, how to interact with my router, how mm -hmm. to tell me, tell everybody what I am. <laughs> I'm a wall okay. socket, I'm a, a switch, I'm a lamp, I'm a fan, whatever. So they were creating uh, from bottom up the whole radio networks, how to talk to each other, mesh, uh, and also to how, how would I uh, tell the network what I am, how to interact with the, uh, the whole, uh, the others and how mm. to I define the network. And they were both doing that. And then they got, well, uh, industries connected as members who would do th the products and so on. So now you have two competing silos where if you, on the same radio, you have C-Way products, which is wall sockets and everything, mm -hmm. and they can interact with each other. They are supported right. by the C-Wave company. <clears throat> so there's, I think there's one or possibly two suppliers of the chip. Okay. So nobody could do the lower levels because they are proprietary from the company from the beginning. Mm. And the same thing in C-Wave. What C-Wave is doing now is that they have realized that their uh, layer, layer 6 and 7 uh, interoperable view mm -hmm. is the same as you need in the IP world. You need to know that a wall socket is a wall socket, rather it's IP or whatever, sure. to know that you should turn it on and off. Now this is in so ZigBee they are or in Z-Wave? In Zigbee, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Zig so Zigbee are removing, no, Zigbee is removing their lower levels. So they are removing their uh, radio layers to enforce six low pan and IP layers. Right. I did see. I did see. A, uh, I think a press release about that maybe two, three months ago in the summer of two thousand and thirteen, if I remember correctly. And so now. You know, what you were saying is both Zigbee and Z-Wave were going all the way from, I guess, layer one to layer yeah. seven, is that, or layer six or seven, is that correct? <laughs> well, both. Uh, I mean, they are doing smart home applications yeah. on top of them. So, so they are more or less up uh, in, in layer seven as well. As well. Uh, but at least in, in six. Okay, at least up until six. And then Zigbee recently said, okay, now... Um, we're now going to maybe move from, maybe just concentrate on layer four to layer six. Uh, I'm asking, is that, is that correct? Yeah. I mean, okay. Uh, and ado adopt then the uh, lower levels from the IP world. Okay. And then they focus, then their advantages or their value add is what exactly by focusing on four to six? Because then they could interact with uh, having an open lower level mm -hmm. bringing in any producer of technology that could do the lower levels right and then they would be uh, very much bo much broader uh, available i mean they could have a uh, smart meter uh, connection then yeah so the okay so, 
so it opens up to far more manufacturers. Like you were saying with Z-Wave, there are a couple manufacturers of chips, and if they wanted to connect up to to any of these lower levels, then these manufacturers had to use these chips. And by adopting more of a standard, in the case of IP, then Zigbee, in this case, can use any hardware and still attach to their system. Yeah, so you could more or less have, have uh, uh, Zigbee over internet, not mm-hmm. not not just in your home. <laughs> now, what exactly is Zigbee doing? What's the value add for Zigbee? So we have, let's say, their radio, and let's say they're standard manufacturers, and they come from hundreds of different manufacturers, and there's these sensors that tell when your windows are open and when they're closed and if your water is going and if your lights are on and so forth. Now, what does Zigbee in particular add to value there? Well, <clears throat> I think there were two focuses. I think Zigbee were aiming more to the smart grid view mm, mm. to be able to get energy efficiency or energy controllable uh, from uh, the utility side. So okay. therefore, they were more aiming at the smart meters and the bigger picture. Okay. And, and that was quite tricky for them then to get that proprietary low levels into right. those areas because they were more reluctant to adopt to a proprietary or, or a smaller solution. So that's, I think, the driver for them to go for uh, IP. Uh, but on the, under, uh, the contrary, then C-Wave is very much into your own home, not mm. connected to internet or, or mm. not doing very large networks. Okay. So why would someone then buy a Zigbee solution? What, what would be the advantage? Well, for me today, I don't see any advantage until they get this IP level <laughs> ready. Okay, but when, let's say that the IP level is ready, then why would someone go with Zigbee once the IP level is ready? Then you could do very much do uh, open interaction between any product. Okay. Uh, so you won't be stuck in one producer line or one silo. Right. Because if you go in, to buy a C-Wave socket, you need to have C-Wave all the way in your house. Mm-hmm. But when going for the IP technology, you can have a Ethernet IPv6 connected wall nice, socket. Nice, nice. Okay. And so their value then, if I understand what you're saying correctly, is in the middleware between the lower level hardware and maybe their application or maybe other applications, but being that glue in between. Is that yeah. accurate? Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay, and Z-Wave, um, they, they, are they moving to IP yet or are they still stuck in their uh, proprietary world they uh, will be stuck there i think i think it's very tricky for them uh, to to go that way why is that i think they're having a uh, more uh, not as layered uh, mm. protocol stack i, so I think it's, it's very yeah i think it's harder for them to to get rid of any piece in the, in the uh, structure hmm <laughs> Interesting, interesting. Well, when I did see the Zigbee announcement, because like you said, there's almost like a, a bit of a holy war between you know the proprietary and the open. But when I saw that, it almost seemed like you know like they wanted to join, and and it does make sense to me if because one of the things that I found in <clears throat> in my investigation of of the Internet of Things, which is relatively new, is that the middleware is really where we're we're finding a need for some sort of either standardization or implicit standardization or something because it seems, you know, you mentioned silos in a number of a number of different times, but it seems to me specifically in the middleware and I guess also on the uh, you know on the lowerware too, but in the middleware there seems to be a need for some sort of either, you know, a large player like Zigbee to kind of be a standard de facto standard or some sort of standardization, because to me it seems like until there's some sort of middleware commonality, a common API or some sort of common you know, specifications, it's going to be very difficult for the Internet of Things to take off just because there's so many of these silos. What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I would say totally the same thing. Uh, mm. Today, when you buy a, a thing, it's most connected to a service and right. a business mo- and a business right. model. Uh, so, <laughs> if if you buy your right. your, uh, your scale <laughs> with a Wi-Fi connection, it cannot talk to you locally. 
it's only yeah. connected to the cloud service right, right. and and in the cloud service you of course would get some open api that some other middleware or function could do some nice <laughs> meshed up service yeah, to, to yeah. lock the door on the refrigerator absolutely but so the yeah. scale will never lock the refrigerator <laughs> refrigerator door no but if but if that scale was you know a common you know a common protocol in this case but maybe it's just a communication protocol and it connected to a common middleware and that would mean this it would be advantageous to the scale company because there'd be many different software applications or services that could talk to it and it'd be very advantageous to the services and applications companies because they would have more potential uh, products that they could talk to and both those cases you know expand the market and make it very interesting for the consumer because now if they buy that scale they know that it can work with these different services or if they buy this service they know that they have all these different products that it can work with. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. I mean, and so until we get through, we can break through that middle, it's almost like a, an hourglass, you know, that middle stoppage. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult to, you know, without having some sort of a serious killer app, it's going to be difficult to be able to break out of that, you know, break out, break out, have, reach escape velocity for internet of things. At least that's my view. Yeah, uh, and I see company now. Uh, this company called uh, Revolve, I think, okay. that are doing a, a gateway for the home, the final one. They have mm. seven <laughs> radio protocols in their gateway. Oh, wow. Okay. To be the middleware between the different silos <laughs> in your home, so you could buy a Zigbee wall socket and talk to a Z-Wave wall socket <laughs> because people. I re- yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember you actually. Um, actually, we traded some emails on this, and, and their their business model is being this uh, uh, interpreter, right? Uh, they yep. just they just interpret between all these different silos, and I suppose at least for them. Uh, and we'll put them in the show notes. I'll get the link and, and so forth. But at least for them, uh, silos is a good thing because their business is basically based on it, I guess. Yeah. and uh, But the trick is when, when business is done, yeah. uh, you, you never uh, would like to have somebody in the middle. Right. So, so if you're creating a new service that you would like to connect to a, ser- uh, a service where you take <laughs> you take money for it. Mm-hmm. You cannot trust someone being the center part because right. then then you would be stuck with him forever. Yeah, yeah. So no, being yeah. that central point, which everybody is, of course, wanting to be, hmm. is very re- reluctant. As soon as you get world domination, the world will go away from you. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's an issue, not just technically, but also financially, because... If you're in there, one, you've got the technical issues of, of being dependent on this middle, you know, this, this preparatory middle middleware connection. But secondly, most likely, they're not doing it for free, you know, otherwise they'd be an open standard, exactly. or, you know, and so you're having to also pay, and that means the consumers have to pay. So I guess that's another reason, a third reason why, you know, this, if you look at it and squint your eyes, eventually it's it has to go open. It has to go open because there's also increased costs in doing it this way. Not only technically in the development, but also then financially in maintaining or support or having to pay these you know recurring fees for this middle software that you know that that's closed. Yeah, and that's uh, taking back to the industry. Mm. IP going into everything in an industry will. Mm slowly do it because it will be cost effective yes if you buy a temperature sensor wireless for doing uh, measurements in in the uh, industry it's very very expensive today <laughs> yeah. most probably it, it will have a, a proprietary radio solution that's probably way extend the, the the level of what you need but going for ip and ip connected devices they will get cheaper prices and it will be easier to integrate yeah we don't so, want an, so, yeah we don't want an internet of separate network of things we want an internet of things do you know what i mean like because the silos you know if for, to reach the i guess you know 
the vision of the Internet of Things, that means everything is is connected, and you have access to to all the devices and, and services that you're looking for, people you're looking for. But if there isn't silos, then then you're having to work with them individually, and that and that doesn't realize the vision of the Internet of Things. No, exactly. And and today we we seen that well, the hardware issue is perhaps moving away uh, because everything is connected to a cloud uh, mm-hmm. in some way. You you don't see the gateway, uh, although you have 10 of them at home, uh, <laughs> but you do see the services. Uh, but the problem is that, well, you have a, one app that is the alarm system. You have one app that is right. the HVAC unit. You have one app that is the scale. And you have one app to the refrigerator. And then you have another app for the stove. Yeah, because right. they are closed in silos, and then people are then of course starting to in, <laughs> integrate the APIs <laughs> on the yeah. cloud side, and we're back again. Mm. Uh, it's not a physical wire. Uh, then <laughs> that is the problem. It's an API explosion that is the problem. Right. Well, everybody is more or less restful, <laughs> but there are slight differences: uh, JSON or SOAP or XML versus other uh, and authentication methods and security methods. And mm-hmm. So th- you always need somebody to do the integration work. Yeah. So it's like an and integration that's the middle way. You, you, yeah, and that's where getting to the middle where you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and that, that obviously adds to uh, the costs as, as well. Yeah. Well, let's change, uh, let's change topics slightly. Um, your presentation, you mentioned it earlier, you have a presentation, uh, you'll be doing the keynote uh, presentation for GoGoNet Live 4, that will be in November of 2013. Um, yes. Now, tell me, why is IP in general, and IPv6 in particular, a main driver of Internet of Things? I know this is, uh, you're going to be talking about this. Yeah, and <clears throat> we've touched on it uh, during our talk here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's the cost and yep. the integratability. Uh, so we will like to connect more and more things. And as doing that with proprietary technology, we get more and more gateways, which makes this more and more impossible or engineering time to get it mm. done. Mm. So IPv6 for doing large networks will be a driver for connecting the small things. And also IPv6 is will be easier for small devices because the networking is much easier. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's more <coughs> technology advanced. So, And, and that's why, why uh, the Contiki OS and the, re- mm-hmm. the research we've seen in Sweden, uh, why are they doing IPv6 addresses on small devices? Well, it's because it's easier than doing IPv4 and doing... Uh, uh, networks and, and you need to know the gateway and it's very complicated to talk mm-hmm. to your mm-hmm. neighbors you need broadcasts and your DHCP and it's, well it's very lot uh, that comes along yeah, that you yeah. Could, that's you all could, done for you of. already right yeah uh, so uh, I think IP is a driver to get everything connected because it's easier cost effective and so on and mm-hmm. that will also drive towards IPv6 so IPv6 will make even smaller and smaller things connected in a cost-effective way. Hmm. Hmm. So, so they will saying, drive each other, I think. So you're saying simplicity and cost um, will be the drivers. Yeah, and, inter- in, right? and integratability. And, and, and in cost, is you know, not just the chips or the physical hardware. It's mm-hmm. the integration work. Okay. And so the use of easier. internet technologies. Yeah, why, why reinvent the wheel again? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, tell us a little bit more about your company, Sustainable Innovations, and um, what you're doing there, and and how uh, we can find information out about it. Well, the easiest is uh, our uh, homepage, mm-hmm. sust. dot se. Okay. Sustainable Innovation in Sweden, uh, and we are doing projects where we put entrepreneurs and new technology into the big companies. So we have a, a bit odd co- uh, construction of the company because we mm. are owned by an organization where big companies are members. So they're more or less our customers. Oh. And we try to do a project where we take a key, uh, key ready project 
from an entrepreneur with technology and the research mm-hmm. areas uh, and the academia together to go to big companies saying, well, we will install this in your facility. We will try it. We will prove that it works together with the entrepreneur and the academia. And you will be provided with a project that is bleeding edge without being afraid of doing something wrong. Mm, almost like an incubator then, in a way. Yeah, uh, without the need of doing uh, any ownership of the entrepreneur. Right, right. <laughs> so just do a good project, get the thing connected in a big project at a big customer. Nice. So what are some good. examples of some projects then? We're doing a very nice one with the Grand Hotel in in Stockholm, okay. where we were using new... Uh, lamps, uh, both LED and others, mm-hmm. uh, changing in the, the 18th century scent chandeliers, <laughs> which was a very tricky wow. thing to do. Wow. Wow. <laughs> you what? cannot change the old lamps. Right. Do right. not, do not. But <laughs> we made it and we saved one megawatt hour wow. in that hotel. Wow, wow. Uh, and finally, in the end, when uh, we talked about behavior changes, uh, I mean, we have never done this before problems <laughs> yeah, <sure. laughs> and getting people. Uh, so they have now an energy education, uh, an electronic en- energy education for all personnel. Uh, and we are doing uh, heat recovery. Mm-hmm. Uh, just the fact that moving away from uh, energy consuming lighting yeah. uh, made it easier to cool the building. Right. The interesting right. thing. For, for a hotel in Sweden was that they wouldn't had a constant cooling need <laughs> although we're living in Sweden <laughs> isn't that strange yeah yeah <laughs> yeah I know it's like the big box stores um, in you know North America they've got those super bright lights and it's the same thing as what you're saying where I used to live before in Montreal for example yeah you're you're in minus uh, degree weather yet you have the air conditioning on because you are heating up with indirectly heating up the environment with the energy that yeah. you're using for the lighting and that's crazy so so that kind of project that we are doing we take a slightly different view of things. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you could find an energy reuse. For example, at the Grand Hotel, again, uh, they are creating hot water to cool their their freezers. So instead of having a rooftop unit getting away the heat, Uh uh, they do the heat into hot water. I like that, right. So, yeah. Uh, And I mean, a hotel is using hot water all the time. Uh, And they have a very large uh, restaurant which needs huge freezer rooms. So So they are, I think they're creating seven cubic meters of hot water from the freezers. Nice. So energy efficiency, it seems like a focus. And how does the Internet of Things come into play here? Uh, To be able to do energy efficiency, you need to be able to control, Mm -hmm. measure, Mm -hmm. and interact with the person to get behavioral changes. Right. And that needs to have connected devices with real-time logic, with real-time measurements, and a lot of big data. To get you to get to change your behaviors, uh, you need to know why and how to interact with it. Uh, of course, in the best of worlds, you would turn off the light yourself <laughs> because you had that behavior change. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but if so, you realize when you come uh, go away from your home and your phone is telling the building that, well, I'm not there anymore and the alarm system has been shut to to uh, the level that it's uh, mm-hmm. active, we could think that we shouldn't be doing any more hot water. Makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. And it would be very tricky for you to teach you to turn off your boiler before you go home, very, away from home. <laughs> very much so. And I think you do bring up a good point. And that is the Internet of Things is not only about the technology, but there are going to be a lot of behavioral changes and a lot of different ways and perspectives that you have to look at things once everything is connected like this. But uh, anyway, with that, I, uh, I think we'll, we'll sign off. I really appreciate your time and uh, looking forward to seeing you in a few days uh, in San Jose for the conference. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Okay. That was an enjoyable talk with Joachim Lindbergh of Sus.se. This podcast goes vertical, deep diving into different topics each week. 
If you prefer a more horizontal and structured approach to learning IoT business and its orbiting technologies, check out my book IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, or become a certified IoT professional by completing the ICIP training and certification program. For details, just go to www.iot-inc.com. Also go to www.iot-inc.com for an analysis of this episode, links to things that were mentioned during the episode, and very importantly, the episode's PDF transcript. Just search for the name of the episode or the guest. If you're new to this podcast, subscribe. That way you'll get every week's episode delivered straight to your device. Or, if you've been listening for a while, there are three ways you can support the show. You can leave a rating or a review on iTunes. Just go to iot-inc.com slash iTunes. It only takes one click to leave a rating, a little bit longer to leave a review. You can share it on social. I'm on LinkedIn, to a lesser extent, on Twitter. And, of course, you can support the show by buying my book, IoT Inc., or the ICIP Training and Certification Program. That's how I pay the bills. Next week's episode is, Would You Like a Network with Those Streetlights? with Sterling Hughes of Silver Spring Networks. Hope you can join me then. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Until next week, may your path to IoT business be a non-siloed one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 